I'd like to welcome all our viewers to this presentation, continuing our series on the sacraments as channels of God's grace. Let us take a moment to begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we come before you with our sufferings, with our griefs, our challenges. We come seeking healing and knowledge of these sacraments of healing, knowing you are the one who truly offers healing. Help us to always be open to what these sacraments offer us, to open, be open to your grace. Help all those who've watched this presentation to come to a deeper understanding of what you offer us in these sacraments and inspire me with the words that you wish your people to heal, to all grow in faith and love of you. This is our fourth presentation in the series on the sacraments. In our first presentation, we spoke about what the sacraments in general represent and some definitions of sacrament. The key definition that I keep repeating comes to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The sacraments are efficacious signs of grace, instituted by Christ, entrusted to the church by which divine life is dispensed to us. Efficacious signs. In these sacraments that we talk about, we really feel an effect. It changes us. It helps us. Instituted by Christ. Once again, we will talk about with the sacraments today. How do we know that they're what Christ intends? And entrusted to the church. Today's sacraments we'll talk about. A little bit more development been done differently in different time periods. Segments always give it the means by which divine life is dispensed to us, meaning it's through the way grace is given to us. I also spoke in the first presentation in this series about sacrament as gift. Sacraments are gifts because we cannot earn them. We can't earn God's forgiveness. We seek it. We are called to come with contrite hearts, but in the end, it's God's gift to us. In the second presentation, we talked about baptism and confirmation. Baptism being the first sacrament to be received before others. We talked about being sealed with receiving the Holy Spirit in it. And how in confirmation, we are receive an increase and in deepening of that baptismal grace. In the third presentation, we talked about the Eucharist, emphasizing the real presence, that the bread and wine do truly become the body and blood of Jesus. But today, as we think about sacraments of healing, we can think about the Eucharist in healing, in the sense of at communion, the priest holds up the host. Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. And we all respond together, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. The Eucharist helps bring us God's healing. That's a short review of what we've come covered so far. If you want, if you haven't seen the whole presentations before, there's a link to direct you to find where you can find it. Tonight we're here to talk about sacraments of healing. When we think about Jesus healing, we might think of the miracles he did. In that context, though, we need to remember Jesus came to heal the whole person, body and soul. We can ask the question, what is healing? How broad of you do we look at it? I have three quotes here from Mary Healy in her book, Healing. The first one says, many people tend to think of healings as secondary to Jesus' real purpose to save souls. But the Gospels tell us otherwise. In the biblical understanding, the human person is an inseparable unity of body and soul. Jesus came to heal people. He heals many people of physical ailments. He drives out many demons. And I will often say, though, that's wonderful in and of itself. That is good. It has purpose. But Jesus came for a broader sense of healing, too, to heal us, to heal our souls. 
So his whole, the second bullet, his whole mission is a, described as a work of healing, restoration of souls and bodies to the fullness that God intends. Of course, she says, Jesus ultimately came to heal humanity's deepest wound, the wound of our sins. And consequence, consequent aliens, alienation from God with all its consequences of spiritual and physical brokenness. Can Jesus comes to heal us body and soul. Well, there are seven sacraments in total. Which ones are sacraments of healing? We've already talked about the sacraments of initiation, baptism, confirmation, Eucharist. Talk about sacraments of healing, anointing the sick. It's all about the sick people, so of course it involves healing. But also reconciliation, healing our souls of sin. And then following presentation, we'll talk about the sacraments of service. So again, which of the seven sacraments are sacraments of healing? Anointing and reconciliation. Anointing brings spiritual healing in times of physical healing. We can pray for the physical healing. Pray for healing from injury or from illness. From cancer and things. But the anointing is also about bringing spiritual healing as we face those struggles and reconciliation healing of our souls for our sins reconciling us with God when we think about sins and how they wound us we also think about our relationships with family friends strangers we also think about our relationship with the church first so now we turn to specifically the anointing of the sick and we can ask the question what does the word anointing mean? The word anointing means, we use it in reference to pouring oil over. Today, we have three oils. They're all come, they're all made of olives. They're all olive oil. But they're used in different ways with different prayers at, at the chrism mass assigned to each one according to their purpose. One is the oil of catechumens, also known as the oil of salvation. Catechumens are ones beginning to learn about the faith. Salvation is what we seek. And the oil of salvation can also be used in baptism. Now, oil of catechumens, in that sense, it's, there's rights in, in the RCA that they can be used. The sacred chrism used in baptisms, confirmations, and Eucharist. This is also olive oil with balsam added to it. And if you have your hands anointed for something with this or your forehead if you rub it and smell it you'll smell the chrism in the oil of the sick in the oil of the sick we can find reference to anointing sick in the gospels matthew 6 13. they drive out drove out many demons and they anointed with oil many who were sick and cured so we know this idea of anointing the sick is in the bible of course, in the New Testament, we also hear many stories of Jesus healing the sick, even touching those the, like the lepers who weren't supposed to be touched, healing them of their physical ailment, but also healing them of the separation from the community to reunite them with the community. They were isolated for protection. Jesus restores them. We think about anointing too in this sense that body and soul people when i've anointed people have talked about a sense of peace they get with it it changes the way they look at the suffering it doesn't take away their physical illness but it changes their view their perspective brings a sense of peace The letter of James, we read this passage. Is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone in good spirits? He shall sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? He should summon the presbyters of the church and they shall pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. 
and the prayer of faith will save the person and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. First to note, when it says the word presbyters, that's what we, becomes what we know today as priest. It tells us specifically to anoint with oil. And it also speaks about forgiveness. Here we think about the forgiveness. As with the Eucharist, we don't have to go to confession for all our venial sins. It's healed in the Eucharist. But if we've committed mortal sins, we need to confess them. What about the anointing of the sick in the Bible in the Old Testament? Well, there's not really references to anointing for sick people in the Old Testament. As the Old Testament describes anointings, kings are anointed when they're made king, priests are anointed when they're ordained, and sacred items like the altar, the tabernacle, the tent where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, involve anointing rituals. Today, when a new church is built, the altar is covered in the oil. Other parts of the church are anointed. I'll send some baking holy, but it got to be present here. Now, while there doesn't seem to be in the Old Testament reference to anointing for sick, sick people are healed. For instance, in Numbers 21, 4 to 9, I have some excerpts from that passage here. The people are getting tired in the desert. They're tired of the struggle. They complained against God and Moses. So God punished them by sending seraphs, seraph servants who came and bit them. Many died. They called out for God for healing. God tells Moses to hold up, put a serpent on a pole and hold it up. And all who look at it in faith will be healed. And they are. Sirach 38, 9. It says, my son, when you are ill, do not delay, but pray to God, for it is he who heals. The Old Testament doesn't have the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. But it does speak of God's healing grace, that which we receive in the sacrament. We can also say, ask the question. Who can receive the anointing of the sick? We must first remember to receive any of the other sacraments of the Catholic Church. You have to first be baptized. And you have to be in a state of grace. By that meaning being free from sin. I already spoke a little bit about how we are um, Renewal sins are forgiven based on James saying your sins will be forgiven. But if we commit mortal sins, we need to confess them. But if someone calls to be asked to be anointed, if they have mortal sin, they need to confess. You can do, do it as part of the ritual. And this is why sometimes when I go to anoint somebody, people's family will say or their friends, can we stay or do we need to leave? And the answer for the anointing is, you can stay. However, if the person wants to go to confession, you need to leave for the confession. Let them confess in private. And then the priest can invite the people back in to be present for the anointing of the sick. When we think about historical development of the sacrament, Anointing is one of these ones that's had different understandings over time. We have this question from a previous evaluation. The person wrote, I am interested in how the focus of the sacraments have changed over the years, or at least as far as how they are presented. The sacrament for many centuries was called extreme unction. Now it's anointing of the sick. But it's important to understand that the Second Vatican Council did not invent a new anointing of the sick, but rather it restored what was found in James 5.13. 
And this is where an important thing to realize when we talk about changes occurring through the Vatican, Second Vatican Council, many of these changes weren't specific to the councils looking for new things. They weren't looking for new things. What was happening in the 20th century is old ancient documents were being found that spoke about how the sacraments were originally celebrated. And that caused a review. What are we really trying to do? And with that understanding, they looked at James 5.13. It doesn't say the anointing of the sick is just for the dying. It just doesn't say, if you are dying, call for the priest to anoint. It says, if you are sick. So why did it become just for the dying? Well, what did I say before to be to receive a sacrament? You need to be in a state of grace, free from sin. For a period of time, forgiveness is seen only happen in baptism. So people would actually wait till near death to be even to be baptized. For fear if they got baptized and then sinned, there was no salvation. Then for confession came, but confession would only be done once. So we'll talk about that a little more when we talk about the sacrament of reconciliation. But people would wait to seek that forgiveness, to seek to be baptized, or seek that one shot at forgiveness. But that meant they weren't in a state of grace. So they couldn't receive the anointing of the sick until they received forgiveness. But they would wait to death again for that fear of sinning afterwards. So the intention, I don't think, was ever to wait for the anointing of the sick till death. It became a consequence of waiting for baptism and reconciliation. So the Second Vatican Council said, no, back up. Plus our understanding reconciliation, we can receive it many times. Now we talk about the right of the anointing of the sick. And there's actually, there's a book we ca have called The Pastoral Care of the Sick, and it lays all these rights out in it. There's rituals designed around anointings at Mass. Basically, you do the Mass, and then generally after the homily, you involve the anointing prayers. You can do it at home, and you can do the whole ritual at home, too, with readings and scripture. There's also a ritual to, designed for in hospitals or homes where the situation is quick. You gotta do the prayers quick. The person's very sick. The hospitals aren't conducive sometimes to long prayer rituals. Somebody's always walking in the room. So a shorter right, what's essential to it. And then there's the dire emergencies. mainly focusing either somebody going in for surgery and you got to be quick, or what we used to call last rites, prayers for the dying. And when we look at the anointing of the sick versus the prayers for the dying, if the person is dying, everything we do in the anointing of the sick, we would do for them. But there are additional prayers, the prayer of commending the, dead, the dying to God in what we call the apostolic pardon one more time of asking God's forgiveness through the holy mysteries of our redemption. May Almighty God release you from all punishments this life and the life to come. May he open to you the gates of paradise and welcome you to everlasting life. So we don't have extreme function or last rites as its own right. But again, there are prayers for the dying. But they don't have to be at the absolute moment of death. We don't know when that's going to come. And you don't know if you're going to be able to get a priest. So you, as soon as you know that time is coming soon, ask for the priest. They can also be coordinated to have family present if they want to be present. The person can be conscious to be aware of themselves. I have people, the doctors will tell them, oh, they, your loved one has about two weeks to live. So they wait 13 days. 
when the doctors say they have two weeks to live, there's there's that no exact time with that. You don't know. And again, if you wait the two weeks, the person may not be able to be conscious of receiving the sacrament. So when the doctor says two weeks, call. But say that, oh, it's two weeks. No, can, either can we schedule a time for you to come? We'd like to be there. And I've already spoken about the place of forgiveness of sins in the sacrament. And we can talk about the things used in the anointing of the sick. And here I quote from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1504. Often Jesus asks the sick to believe. He makes use of signs to heal, spittle and laying, the laying of hands, mud and washing. The sick tried to touch him, for power came forth from him and healed them all. And so in the sacraments, Christ continues to touch us in order to heal us. We don't use spittle and mud today. We use oil. Why oil in the sacrament? If you think about it, if, if you got muscle aches or cramps, you know, you, you put a cream on it and it can soothe that. We use oil in the same sense. We also use a laying of hands. Think of how Jesus touched the lepers, how that touch can be a kind of contact. Although recognizing illness, laying of hands can be a touch. And, person is touched with the oils. But there are times due to illness and contagion factors that the laying of hands may not be a touch, but it's still a praying over. I've already spoken about the oils, the oils we use in this sign, strengthening it is for us. I want to talk about the prayer of anointing. And first of all, the prescribed ritual is to anoint the person on the forehead, making a sign of the cross, and then on the palm of the hands for the laity. Saying these words, through this holy anointing, may the Lord in his love and mercy help you with the grace of the Holy Spirit. It's calling God, asking God, work through this anointing. Give this person your love and your mercy, grace. And it speaks of being freed from sin, coming from James 5, 13. Save you and raise you up. That raise you up is also in that passage from James. When we raise you up, remember the anointing of the sick. This part of the ritual is used for anybody being anointed. So it's not just a death thing or raise them up in the resurrection. That will come, and we pray that when the death comes, that we are raised up in the resurrection. But also think about God lifting us up in the sacrament, strengthening us through it. When someone is sick, we pray for their healing. We should pray for their healing. When we think about the effects of the anointing of the sick, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1520, reminds us that the first grace of the sacrament of the anointing is one of strengthening, peace, and courage to overcome the difficulties that go with the condition of serious illness or frailty of old age. It renews our faith and trust in God, knowing that the, temp the evil one tries to tempt us when we are weak. Tired, say, oh, God doesn't, isn't helping you. God doesn't exist in that. No, God does exist. God wants us to be aware of that, and so he offers us the sacrament. And in celebrating the sacrament, Lumen Gentium, paragraph 11, Lumen Gentium being a document of the Second Vatican Church, speaks of the sacrament, commending those who are ill to the suffering of the glorified Lord. Jesus suffered for us, uniting our sufferings to his. We unite ourselves to his passion and death, remembering what he went through for us, remembering that he does that because he loves us. 
and to show us that suffering can lead to redemption. And so we offer up our prayer, loved ones, rending them to the Lord. I spoke about the ideas of an extreme unction, the last rites being at the point of death versus early anointings. The Catechism of the Catholic Church clearly says it's not just for those at the point of death, but even when the danger of death begins to come, the time for the second arrived. So the church now says any serious illness. We don't need to be anointed for the sniffles. Going in for heart surgery, anointing can be a wonderful thing. But also, the church recognizes old age can bring with it its infirmities. I don't mean just being old. You can see a 90-year-old looks very healthy sometimes. But typically, we can't do as much. We grow in fur. So we can seek the anointing. What about how many times a person can be anointed? Where well, it was extreme unction, generally you'd be so close to the point of death that you probably did die. So you'd only receive it once. But the church says in the Catechism of the Catholic Church again, paragraph 1515, this time, if a person recovers and faces a, a different illness, they can receive the sacrament anointing again. Or with the same illness, if it progresses to getting worse, you can repeat the sacrament. And the same holds for the elderly. As we get older, we get old, anointed once because of the infirmities. But as those infirmities continue and develop, we can be anointed again. So we won't be anointed continuously. It's not a call to be anointed every week. But as months pass by or years, to seek the Lord's grace. As we heard in James 5, it said, call the presbyters, the priests. So the priests are the ones anoint. Deacons do not anoint. Bishops do because all bishops are deacons. Uh, excuse me, all bishops are priests. Lastly, with the anointing of the sick, who is the patron saint of the anointing? Looking up, I didn't find any one particular saint that's patron saint of the anointing of the sick, but there are, of course, patron saints of the sick, like St. John of God, who, when he had faced a serious illness himself, was young, and then cared for sick people, showing his love for them. So he's a patron saint of the sick. St. Camillus, who had a diseased leg, but also cared for the sick. St. Michael the Archangel is one who protects us. And then the patron saints of the dying, thinking of St. Joseph. There are stories that say when St. Joseph died, Jesus and Mary would have been at his side. So it was a good death, peaceful death. So when our loved ones die, we pray for Joseph's intercession, intercession to help them, our loved one, have a peaceful death with his loved ones at their side. That's the anointing of the sick. And now we're going to shift to the sacrament of reconciliation. And again, this sacrament has been known by different names. The most common one probably has been, in, at least in recent decades, has been confession. And confession is indeed an important component of the sacrament. Likewise, penance. We receive a penance. It is part of what we celebrate in the sacrament. What we must do to fulfill the sacrament. But confession, penance, they're both, they're part of the sacrament. They're required parts of the sacrament. They are necessary parts. But what's the purpose for the sacrament? Is it not to be reconciled with God? So my favorite name for the sacrament is the sacrament of reconciliation. Another name for the sacrament over the years has also been 
metanoia. In the early church documents, this is one used. Metanoia means conversion. We sin, we're seeking to change our ways, to live as God calls us to live, but recognizing we need his forgiveness as we undergo conversion. Turning to finding the sacrament in the New Testament. In Matthew 9, chapter 9, verses 1 to 8, along with Matthew chapter 2, speaks to the story of the healing of of the paralytic. Jesus has already healed various peoples of illness at this point. In the culture of that time, the faith of that time, saw many illnesses as punishments for sin. When Jesus speaks of healing this paralytic, he speaks not just of healing the man, of his paralysis, he speaks of forgiving sin, revealing that he has this power. There are those who present will say, oh, you're committing blasphemy, saying you can forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. Yes, only God can forgive sins. Jesus, Son of God, consubstantial with the Father. He has the power to forgive sins. And then in John's Gospel, after the resurrection, Jesus appears to his disciples. And in chapter 20, verses 19 to 23, he speaks of the power. And in verse 23, he explicitly says, Whose sins you are for, forgive, whose sins you forgive are forgiven him, and who you retain are retained. Matthew 18, 18 has a parallel. This is seen as the moment when God gives them the power to forgive sin. The power that Jesus has, he shares with those he calls to priesthood. Looking at the Old Testament, first off, Sin has existed from the beginning. We only get three chapters into the Bible, in the book of Genesis, before we hear the story of the original sin. Adam and Eve eating the fruit of the tree. One chapter later, more sin, Cain and Abel. Sin has been there since the garden. Sacrifices of sins, rituals, not set the sacrament of reconciliation we know it today, but rituals, specific dying, begin to appear in the book of Leviticus. The Old Testament has its own rituals that Jesus gives us in the sacrament of reconciliation. The Old Testament has sac rituals for the forgiveness of sins, the offering of sacrifices, sacrifices of animals that we don't need to offer anymore. Those sacrifice had, sacrifices had to be repeated over and over. Jesus offers a perfect sacrifice, sacrificing his own life for us, to make it possible for us to be forgiven, to be reconciled with God. Turning to the historical development, I already mentioned when anointing is sick of how it was thought you had to wait to be baptized. And in the earliest times, the only forgiveness of sins came with baptism. So you waited to be baptized. Then it developed that, okay, you got one chance after baptism. And developed them to be repeatable. Why repeatable? Did someone, someone say, well, I did terrible things. I better change the rules. Did humanity change the rules because we sinned so much? No. They remembered. To the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You know, remember the sac definition of sacrament. Entrusted to the church. Led by the Spirit. Jesus said, I say to you, not seven. When Peter asked the question, how many times must I forgive? Seven times? Jesus says, I say not seven times, 
but 77 times. And it's not even 77. Jesus' point is you keep forgiving over and over. So as reconciliation became repeatable, it was still seen as a big process. They actually had an order that they would call an order of penitence. When you sin, you would join this order. How long would depend on your sins? It might be a few weeks, maybe longer. To make atonement for your sins. And in those days in the early church too, confession was public. We have, among others perhaps, the Celtic monks to thank for making it a private confession. But with that also came the development of books called the Penitentials, different books in different time periods. But the Penitentials listed sins and listed punishments for it. Now you go to confession, a penance might be to say some prayers. And I, I remember tell people to say X number of our fathers, Hail Marys, and that. But as you do so, I say, think about this aspect of your sins. What help do you need from God to change that? How can you open yourself to it? As we turn to talk about the ritual of going to confession, to the Sacrament of Reconciliation. I want to take a moment to talk about people's experience of confession. Generations before the Second Vatican Council grew up going to confession monthly, if maybe sometimes week by week, every two weeks, every week, because, oh, you must have done something wrong. It's something you had to have done. And I've also heard of experiences of people getting yelled at in the confessional. It's not where it's meant to be. We have this quote in a clip art from Pope Francis. The confession oh, is not a torture chamber, but a place in which the Lord's mercy motivates us to do better. I haven't had the experience of being yelled at in the confession. I think in my experience, when I came back to church after 16 years of not going, I went to confession the first time. The priest was so excited that I came came back, yes, I confessed my sins, but he talked about ha being happy and how wonderful it was I was back. That's how God feels. Think of the story of the prodigal son, Luke 15. The father rejoices when his son returns, and so God rejoices when we repent of our sins and seek him. Today's emphasis is more on the sacrament as a sacrament and what it means for us. Some of you, especially if you haven't been a while, might want to know more about the how-to of the sacrament. And there I point you to on this slide, I have a link to two other videos I did. Um, the first one talks about the sacrament and that, so like a 10 minute video, I think everything in that presentation is covered in this presentation. The second video there, though, it takes about 13 minutes to watch. It does overlap with someone I've said today. But it's actually taped inside a confessional. And it talks about how going, how to go to confession, what you need to do. And I, if you go to that web page, you'll also find three handouts. One about how the sacrament of reconciliation is a gift. One on examining your conscience. And one written down of how to go to confession. There are th three rights described for confession. The first is individual. That's the one most familiar to us. Then there's the option of a pe group penance service with individual confessions afterwards. Priest available. This starts with a liturgy, a penance service. And then there's general absolution. And in the Things that have happened um, following the Second Vatican Council. There was a period when penance service were, were celebrated with general absolution, almost becoming a norm in some places, including in our diocese. That's no longer understood as the norm. The church has clarified what it intends 
Because what was happening is the rules about general absolution say when there's a large number of penitents whose confession cannot be heard in a reasonable amount of time, the priest may grant general absolution. So that became misunderstood to mean, oh, there's 50 people here. It would take me five or six hours to hear their confessions, general absolution. But that wasn't the intent. It says large number of penitents, so you can't hear, hear in a reasonable number of time. Amount, excuse me, a reasonable amount of time. A long line is not a need for that, providing there's time available. It doesn't even have to be the same day to be a reasonable amount of time. What general absolution is meant for is when death may be coming. You think of military soldiers going off into battle. They're leaving in half an hour. You're not going to give a whole battalion individual confession to that. You give them general absolution. I also think of when we go to anoint the dying person and they're not responsive. We don't know what sins they may have committed, so the words of absolution are always given at that point for the benefit of the person. But note, if the shoulders going back off in the battle, if they survive and come back, they're still expected to confess their sins. The person who's dying, unable to confess their sins. If they recover, they're still expected to confess their sins. Now, before everybody who went to penance services for a year received jet years for and received general absolution, thinking you were fine, God understands you are doing what you were taught. You did not sin in going to those services. You did what you were taught. Learn and do better. Now, with the rites of reconciliation, you can start with a prayer. Although most people for individual confession walk in and they always begin, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been X amount of time since my last confession. And they go right in their, their confession. In individual confession, that's fine. And there's also a scripture passage that you can read some scripture. Almost never done in individual confession. But with a penance service, you're starting, I was, you're starting with prayer and scripture. And then comes the confession of sins. Whatever sins you need to confess, you confess. And here I bring up the idea of this seal. The seal of confession is absolute. I don't even tell somebody if somebody goes to confession. That's not other people's business. We do not tell. And priest, I know, we pray to forget what you say. We don't want to remember what you confess. And after you confess your sins, the priest may offer counsel. Some advice, if you've Depending on what you've confessed, the priest might ask, you know, if you say it's been, you come in say it's been 10 years and you confess one sin, the priest might say, what about other sins? What about stealing or lying or other things? To help you make a good confession. Or receiving counsel, advice. It's meant to be short here. When we do an individual confession, it's not meant to be a counseling session. That can be done. If you need a, know you need a lot of advice from the priest, you have questions, say so. And confession can be part of that, but the confession isn't about being a counsel session. It's just to help you. Maybe, you know, like with your sins, do you realize, does this sin lead to the other sin? It's helping you try and get perspective on your sins. And then, of course, there's penance, contrition, act of contrition, prayer of absolution which we'll get into in the coming slides here. First, I'll ask you, what things are used in reconciliation? You know, in baptism, we use water. We use oil. We use a lighted candle, white garment. Confirmation, oil again. Eucharist, bread and wine. Anointing of the sick. 
oil. In reconciliation, we don't use physical things. The things of the sacrament of reconciliation are, word, are words and the attitude we come with. And with that in mind, the four elements of reconciliation are contrition, confession, penance, and absolution. To talk about contrition, I have one version of the act of contrition here. Note there are various versions. If this isn't the one you know, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to change to this one. What I want to talk about is point out a couple things. The act of contrition. The word contrition means being sorry for our sin. The first thing we say, my God, I am sorry for my sins with all my heart. To receive this sacrament, we have to be sorry. We have to be contrary. And that means that we desire to sin no more. And here's the part people struggle with. Father, in the act of contrition, I say I firmly intend with your help to do penance to sin no more. And then I go out and sin. And I go out and sin with the same sins. I can't seem to change. Does that invalidate my previous confession? No. If you firmly intend, God understands. Conversion is difficult. Change is difficult. But we must intend to do better. And with that, we can speak of both perfect contrition and imperfect contrition. The Catechism of the Catholic Church describes perfect contrition in paragraph 1452. When it arises from a love by which God is loved above all else, contrition is called perfect, contrition of charity. Such contrition remits venial sins. It also obtains forgiveness of mortal sins if it includes the firm resolve to have recourse to sacramental confession as soon as possible. Maybe you've realized you've committed a sin, a mortal sin, and you can't get to confession right away. If you are truly understand, un, truly contrite for your sin, God's forgiveness comes as long as you intend to confess when you can. If you die without confessing it, if you truly intended to, God understands. Then there's imperfect contrition, which paragraph 1453 describes as the contrition called imperfect is also a gift of God, a prompting of the Holy Spirit. It is born of the consideration of sin's ugliness, the fear of eternal damnation. By itself, however, imperfect condition, contrition cannot obtain the forgiveness of grave sins, but it disposes one to obtain forgiveness in the sacrament of penance. Here I think of things, well, you know, Father, this I did this. I'm not sure if it was a sin. I didn't mean to sin. I was trying to do good, but I don't know. If it is a sin, I'm sorry. I don't want to offend God. So you're open to being contrary. You're open to God's mercy. You're open to following God's way. But you're not quite sure about your sins. Put it in God's hands. Confess it. He will forgive it. Then there's penance. Penance, those prayers, being told to do something, is not simply punishment. Making or making up for our sins satisfaction. It's it, the penance is to serve as evidence of our contrition. God, I'm sorry. I'm willing to do my penance because I'm sorry for my sins. The penance can be interpreted as an outward sign. But that outward sign is not the point of the, what's going on. The point is conversion of heart, interior conversion. But interior conversion, conversion that it's, is expressed in visible signs, gestures, and works of penance. Then comes the part of the whole point of coming to the sacrament of reconciliation. To receive absolution. To receive forgiveness. 
I'm going to say the words of absolution now. This is not the sacrament. It is not to offer forgiveness at this particular moment. But to hear the words, to think about the words. God, the Father of mercies, through the death and resurrection of his Son, has reconciled the world to himself and sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins. Through the ministry of the church, may God give you pardon in peace. And I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three persons of the Trinity involved in the sacrament. It is God who forgives us. That forgiveness is made possible by the death of Jesus Christ. And sent the Holy Spirit to show us this, reveal to us this forgiveness of sin. I feel that. God is merciful. The Lord is kind and merciful. Jesus came to forgive us. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he sent his only son not to condemn us but to save us. Forgiveness is possible by what Jesus does for us on the cross. We experience that forgiveness through the sacrament of reconciliation. The effects of reconciliation, obviously, the point is to be reconciled with God. You can read about that in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I'll quote from Lumen Gentium, that Second Vatican Council document again, paragraph 10. Those who approach the sacrament of penance obtain pardon from God's mercy for the offense they committed against him and are, at the same time, reconciled with the church whom they have wounded by their sins and by which, by charity, by example and prayer, labors for their conversion. And note the church here, I typed it with a capital C. Meaning, grand church. It's not just the, the institutional church, but a greater sense of church. The church that Jesus gives us. When we sin, most importantly, we're turning away from God. We're also turning away from what the church offers us and are reconciled with that in the sacrament. Who can receive the sacrament of reconciliation? Well, remember, our two requirements for, to receive all the sacraments after baptism, to be baptized, and to be in a state of grace. Well, with reconciliation, you're not in a state of grace when you come. In fact, if you're in a state of grace, you don't need the sacrament. It's the sacrament that after baptism, when we've sinned, restores us, gives us the grace we need to be free from sin, to be in a state of grace, to know God fully, to receive the other sacraments. Who presides? Deacons don't hear confessions. Don't celebrate the sacrament. It's priest, including bishops, again. Coming that when Jesus spoke those words, whose sins you forgive are forgiven, who you retain, whose sins you retain are retained, he's speaking to the immediate group that become the clergy. And he's inviting us to receive forgiveness. The question that comes up, why confess to a human priest? I know it would come up, it's been written on prior evaluations. I struggle with the idea of going to confession. I don't struggle with the idea of being sorry for my sins and asking God for forgiveness. Why does the priest need to be involved? Well, one, realize that the priest is acting in the person of Christ, in persona Christi. They're acting as an instrument of God in this, instrument of Christ bringing us that forgiveness. And they are then in turn the conduit from which God offers us the grace of the sacrament.
And confessing our sins to the priest is a sign of our contrition too. If you think about it, in confessing to God, two things come to mind for me. Number one, realize you're not telling God anything he doesn't already know. Whatever your sins are, when you committed those sins, God was there. The point of confessing our sins out loud is for our benefit, to show our contrition, to show our genuine desire to change. To seek God's forgiveness. His love, his mercy. There's also something therapeutic for us in speaking it out loud. Now, you're not going to go out and tell the whole world all your sins, but if you've been keeping something in, hiding it from somebody, doesn't it feel good sometimes to get it out, to be able to say to somebody, I did this, I'm sorry, and I've been lying about it, I want to stop. There's a therapeutic value in that. God doesn't tell us to confess to a priest to punish us. Priests aren't willing to do this because they want to hear the naughty stuff. I'm sorry, your confessions aren't that interesting. It's all designed for our good in mind. The effort it takes to come to confession sometimes, especially if we've done something really terrible, I tell people part of your penance sometimes, especially if you've been in a long time, is getting yourself there, giving up the nerve to come and confess your sins. Some other points to ponder. The first two bullets here I'll talk about together. Examination of conscience and how often should one go to confession. Anytime you realize a need to go to confession, it may re you're Recognizing your need might revolve around one sin, but maybe you got others. So before you go, do an examination of conscience. On the website I gave earlier about my videos, um, there's an examination of conscience there. If you get on the internet and you Google examination of conscience, you'll find various ones to ask you questions, to help you to think about, make sure you confess all your sins. To the question of how often one should go to confession, as I said, people used to go monthly, if not more often. Now the pendulum swung and some people go a long time without going. Some people will say, how often should I go? The answer is, how often do you sin? If you know you've committed mortal sin, you should go to confession as soon as you can. If you go some length of time, then do an examination, without being aware of sin, do an examination of conscience. In fact, I would say, at the end of every day, it might be good just to reflect on the day and think, did I do anything? Yeah. If you did, ask as a venial moral sin. But you can do that very informally. Just, what was my day like? If you go a month or longer without being aware of sin, you might examine your conscience formally, sitting down, finding examining your conscience, going through the questions. If you find you have sinned, go to confession. If you haven't, you haven't. But then it can beg the question, what about if you don't mention a sin? Well, if you forget a sin after genuinely trying to confess, genuinely trying to confess all your sins with an examination of conscience. If you forget it, the church says it's forgiven. If you remember it later, the church says you don't need to go right into confession because it's forgiven. But the next time you go to confession, you just simply say, Father, I after, after my last confession, I realized I think I forgot to confess this sin. Say it, it's forgiven. 
be done with it. On the other hand, if you knowingly admit a sin, and you're hiding, you're not, you haven't expressed that contrition. And I understand we don't like to admit our bad things. We'd rather talk about the good things. That's why we have the seal of confession, so it can't be told. Don't hide it. If you hide it, you're holding it in. You're not handing it over to God. Hand it over. Then there's always the question of venial versus mortal sin. We don't need to confess venial sin. We need to confess mortal sin. Although when you go to confession, you can confess the venial sins too. But you have to go for mortal. What's the distinction? Well, if you kill somebody, it's a mortal sin. If somebody cuts you off in traffic and you get upset and you kind of fume a little bit but mainly passes, being ill at worst. The extremes can be obvious. The area in between can be gray. When in doubt, confess it. Don't sit there and mule, is this a sin or isn't it? I don't know, I don't know what to do. If you're not sure, confess it. <sighs> Coming near the end, we can ask the question, who is the patron saint of reconciliation? Well, I found two people listed as um, patron saints to ask to help make a good confession. St. Gerard Magella, he is known for the gift of reading conscience. conscience. And St. John Nepo Mussini, who heard the confession of a queen and was murdered because he wouldn't tell the king what she confessed. That's how far the seal went. He would not tell. And then there's also the patron saint of penitent sinners, Mary Magdalene. We ask for their intercession. Help us always make good confessions. Lastly, we come, whoops, I think I, Um, for homework on this, go to confession if you need to. There's resources on the, my other web page that I gave you the link to. You can Google for help. Going forward, our future, um, our next presentation, which will be on the sacraments of service, matrimony, and holy orders, is scheduled for May 6th right now. It will be an in-person presentation. Hopefully, um, watch for rescheduling information based on that. Um, right now, this is 2020. We have the coronavirus going on. So that's subject to change. Thank you all for watching this presentation. I hope it helps you to see the treasure we have given to us in the gifts of the sacrament.